Well, I think Steiner gave us a unique way to look at the child. And I often think about what kind of teacher I would have been if I hadn't encountered Waldorf education. I was a public school teacher in New York City, and there were so many things about children that I didn't understand, that I was trained to see conventionally. But the insight that Steiner gave us, it, in a way, it unlocked the mystery of the child, or began to unlock the mystery of the child. It's kind of an ongoing um, learning process for a teacher. But he set out this picture of child development, which you just don't find anywhere else, that children go through these three distinct stages of development. And that's a real gift, because it helps me as a class teacher to know what should be my emphasis with children. So for instance, in the preschool, the teachers know that the young child learns through doing. And what they do in the presence of the child is the most important thing, so that the child imitates imitates the beautiful way in which they speak, the way in which they prepare their meals, the way in which they clean up. All that the preschool teacher does in front of the child is of great importance. For the grade school teacher, what we're told through Steiner's insight is what we feel is what matters. And so the mood of, our mood, our emotional mood in the class in a way creates the weather in the room. And children always do things that a teacher doesn't expect or wish to see. How we meet that is going to, to really affect the way in which they look at us. Because if we are harsh in our response, then in a way they retreat emotionally. And if we're warm, then they feel relaxed enough and safe enough that they can begin to deeply enjoy and appreciate and love the work that they do in the classroom. And everything that Steiner gave to the schools, he, for the grade school, he did so that we could really maximize this feeling life of children. And so keeping children together for eight years in the same class with the same teacher, it allows that emotional bond to develop. And then all the things that we do together uh, that become part of the rhythm you know, that's an important word in Waldorf education, the rhythm of the day, all of that affects the breathing. And our breathing is deeply connected with our feeling. So Steiner really urged us to be aware of how children breathe in our presence. You know, do we bombard them with information so that they're always gasping for breath? Or do we allow them this natural interplay of breathing in and breathing out? And that's why the movement that you see in the classroom, it's like a natural exhaling for the children. So we have moments when they take in information and they breathe in and they're attentive and they're still. But then we know we have to give them moments when they can breathe out and express themselves artistically or express themselves through movement. And that's a delicate balance. And what I've learned through Steiner's work is that that balance is something that varies day to day. So on Monday, it's a very different balance that you try to achieve than on a Friday. And we all know this in the workplace. We know how different Monday is than Friday. But to become conscious of that in a classroom really enables us to assist the children. Those kind of insights, I don't believe I could have ever come to in the same way without the guidance and the direction of Rudolf Steiner. Similarly, um, with, with Steiner, um, one of the things that surprised me was the realization that it wasn't just his clairvoyant knowledge that shaped our education. Sure, truly, our Waldorf school is shaped on his clairvoyant perception. That's how he perceived the three uh, eras of childhood. And so much of his expertise and guidance comes from that knowledge. But what he saw in the world also uh, was extraordinary because of his awareness. So he could see people working in a field in Europe at his time, and he would see how when they would um, sigh of the fields, they would do it rhythmically. And it, for Steiner was the awareness that when you work rhythmically, your work is less tiresome. And so he urged teachers, anything that you have to do day after day, do it rhythmically. So our times tables, when we do them rhythmically, it makes something that can be dreary more palatable, the way it was for the workers when they work and sang in the fields. Anytime you do something with music and rhythm, it becomes more buoyant, and so it doesn't get heavy and dull. And those are the kind of insights 
that I think are, are, are just so important and I'm grateful. What he said was that we should think of the children like plants and educators just do. You know, we call our early grades nurseries and kindergartens and we talk about a teacher being a sower of seeds and, uh, you know, we watch children the way gardeners watch plants. We look for health and we look for the weeds that have to be removed. But Steiner said that, the, that you should see the child as a, as a plant that's growing down to earth, one that's upside down so it's rooted in the, in the heavenly. There's that wonderful verse by Wordsworth. You know, that our, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The star that rises in us, our life star, had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. And these children come from afar down to earth, and we have to draw them down to this new life they're taking. And the preschool teachers know that they do this by providing for them a sense that the world is good. And a class teacher, our job is to provide for them a sense that the world is beautiful. You know, the way we speak, the stories we tell, the, the way we write on the board, the drawings, all of that. But for the high school in this third phase, which comes with uh, around the age of 13 or 14, um, when the grade school time from seven or six to 13 ends, that's a new phase also. And it's this understanding that for the high school student, it's not beauty that's important, it's not goodness that's important, it's truth. The high school student wants to know is the world true? And what is true in this world that they live in? And that is part of the exploration that they do, and it's part of the test that they put everyone to. Are you true in what you stand for? And do you walk your talk? Um, the, the high school student isn't living in the realm of feeling as much in the realm of thinking. And it begins in pre-adolescence, around 12, where this critical thinking comes in but it reaches full flower in the high school. And each year, it progresses this ability to think in a new way um, about the world and to see things from various points of view. Uh, I became a Waldorf teacher because I was so completely impressed with what I saw the Waldorf high school students being able to do. When I went to a, um, a high school open house in, on Long Island where I grew up, um, there were displays of students' work, and I remember standing over one boy's work, and he had on the table, he had a, a globe that he'd made in woodwork. He had a beautiful stained glass. He had these main lesson books that had these precise but exquisite drawings of comparative anatomy, the skeleton of a horse, the skeleton of a lion. And then he had a shirt that he had sewn by hand or with a, a machine that he had made, beautiful flannel shirt. And I thought, now here's an 18-year-old, and he's capable of so much more than I'm capable of. And I'm a graduate student with a master's degree now and a gra an undergraduate degree, and yet his education has made him so much more capable than mine. And the other thing was when I spoke with the young people, I felt that they knew who they were. And I found that incredibly valuable, that an education can give you a sense of yourself and that you could come to know yourself through the books you read in high school, uh, through the study of Faust or Emerson or Dickinson, through the study of history, through the study of the natural world. And, and I knew for myself that I'd spent my time in college finding out who I wasn't. And so I really valued what they'd been given. Gretchen? Look at your mom. See you tomorrow. I don't know if I can go to aftercare. There's a lot of people going. Would you like to say something, Jack, about the curriculum itself in relation to the, to the growing child and correspondence? Well, I'm glad you asked that because that's the, the other gift that Steiner gave us. Um, the way he designed the curriculum, it, it mirrors the changes that go on in the children. Because when you take them in first grade, they're so different than they're going to be when they're in seventh and eighth grade. And I always like to feel that our journey with children is a journey from warm to cool. The young child is very warm, sympathetic, and quick to embrace the adults in their world. A uh, first grade teacher is always surrounded by little children who want to hold their hand, to eat lunch with them, to stand by their side. If you walk into the seventh or eighth grade, they can't be farther away from their teacher 
uh, you know, if they had a choice, they'd sit in the back row, and if that wasn't far enough away, they'd lean back, all right? So there's this coolness that comes in, and the curriculum meets that changing development of their inner life. And so the, the subjects we study mirror their changes. So for instance, in fourth grade, we study geography. And the fourth grader, their world is expanding. They come into an awareness that they didn't have when they were little. And so they start to be aware of the world around them and that understanding they wanted to grow. So I remember as a child that age, there was always a street that you weren't allowed to cross. The, the sort of the parameter of your safe area where your parents said you can go this far. But around nine or 10, you start to have this growing urge to cross that street. And that Steiner recognized. And so he said in fourth grade, teach them geography, local geography. So we map out our school, we map out our route to work, we study our locale, and it's the perfect assignment for the children. Um, so they feel similarly about the world of the animal kingdom, which children love. Fourth grade, it's a perfect time to begin the study of science. Steiner felt that when the children go through this change, which he called the nine, 10 year change, they really change to the world. He said, that's the time to begin to teach science. And it's also the time to begin to teach fractions because for the child that age, the world was previously whole. Everything was one and they were happier in it. There's a sadness that comes in around nine or 10. I, I think the uh, poet, American poet, Billy Collins put it best. He said, uh, I, it used to be that my bicycle never leaned against the garage the way it does today all the dark blue speed drained out of it. I used to believe that under my skin was light. If you cut me, I would shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. And that sadness Steiner recognized, he said that if a teacher is aware of the change that goes through a child's soul at this age, he can make an incredible difference in their life that that change shouldn't be unnoticed. You'll see it in children's eyes, it's a quiet change. But the curriculum is designed to meet that change. It starts in third grade when they study the, the, old, the stories from the, the, the Bible and they hear about the expulsion from the Garden of Eden because that's what they're beginning to do. They're leaving this world where all was peaceful and good. And it continues with the study of fractions and you see those fractions in the class, the children that were one whole class before, now they're little groups. You know? and so as a teacher, you're always looking to find a common denominator to keep things whole. And you can see it in the Norse stories that you tell in fourth grade, where you have the twilight of the gods. Because now the adults in their world, the children see they're, no, they're not perfect. And this also brought to them in a therapeutic way. That's Steiner's gift. Uh, to us and it just runs right throughout the grade school curriculum and I've always found that and I found that the subjects that are unique to Waldorf the ones you don't find other places they're the ones where Steiner's insight for me is most remarkable so for instance in sixth grade you do these geometric drawings where you take those compasses and those straight edges and they make these elaborate designs and it just meets the sixth grader who has this new thinking capacity being born in them and it demands precision. And with the geometric drawing, if you're off when you divide a circle by just a sixteenth of an inch, that is a noticeable mistake by the end. So you have to be exacting in the way you sharpen your pencil and the way you make your line. That's the kind of precision that sixth graders demand of the adults around them. You know, you said that we were gonna do it this way. They want it to be that precise and it's wonderful for them to be asked to, to meet that same standard. But the other beauty is that Steiner designed this education and that this I feel is his, his great gift and I don't know that we recognize it completely yet, but he designed this education to be a, a fully human education and by that he knew it needed to use both sides of the brain. And the current research a brain research that's going on just validates Steiner's insights. For instance, um, they say that when you look at a child's brain when they're learning an alphabet, you find 
that children who are being taught an alphabet through abstract symbols and pictures, that it causes the electrical impulses to cross the brain over the, this fibrous top, and that for a neuroscientist is a sign of higher order thinking. And so that's what happens when children learn Chinese and Japanese. But it also happens in a Waldorf school when they start with those picture letters, and out of that comes their alphabet. It's that full brain experience. They say the same thing when a child plays violin. If they were to hook little electrical sensors up to a child, when a child plays violin, the whole brain is engaged. One side, the right side, because of this, the beautiful music and the affective experience, and the other side because they're reading abstract notation. You know, both sides of the brain, and it's the same way in geometric drawing, and it's very much the same way in your rhythm and, it, and form drawing. So it makes me feel that the, the elements that Steiner put on, that are in, put in our curriculum that are unique to Waldorf, they're all whole brain experiences. And when you read what people are writing today about the new global economy and what's gonna be asked of children, it's a wonderful book by Daniel Pink called The Whole New Mind. He says that it's using both the right and left side of the brain that's gonna be asked of us in the future. And it's made me feel that our schools are really ahead of our time. And that's what I came to feel about Steiner, was that his ideas that he put forth 100 years ago, when he first started speaking about Waldorf education, 1907 and eight, he gave these lectures that became the education of the child, that he was putting forth ideas that were just 100 years ahead of their time. And because Steiner really has shown us that ideas are real, that there comes a time when ideas are born everywhere. And when you look around in education, the understandings that were essential to Waldorf education, they're now coming to life in education in a variety of places. Because the time is now when this understanding of how we should teach the child using the fullness of their brain, how we should teach children through activity, how we should be aware of their emotional intelligence, how we should allow teachers to loop with children, how we should allow teachers to design curriculum. It's all really coming to the fore. Now, I'm, just a few years ago, um, the MacArthur Foundation, which gives in America these genius grants, you can't apply for them. They find the people that they uh, award. They gave a genius grant to a woman, Deborah Meyer, who was a principal in Harlem. And she had this very successful school in East Harlem. And they commended her for three things. They commended her for realizing that education could not take place in a meaningful way in a 45-minute class. And so she doubled her lessons. And they commended her for understanding that when you teach through a, a combination of curriculum material, so you teach art, th science through art, or math through writing, or history through music, children learn better. And then she all, they also commended her for realizing that teachers in a school should be making the decisions that influence the school. And they gave her the genius grant. But Walter schools have been doing that for 70 years, or 80 years at the time. And it just made me realize that these ideas are being born everywhere. Is, is there a, a dialogue between Waldorf education and mainstream education, is, is a dialogue? A, is there a dialogue here in the States developing? I wish I could say that it was happening in um, a marked way, but it happens more in small ways. There are educators who are coming out of mainstream who can appreciate what Waldorf has to offer. But unfortunately, they're few and far between. And in our climate in, Amer in America, with no child left behind and the tremendous pressure on testing that came out of the Bush era and has continued, unfortunately, with President Obama, it's very hard for the ideas of, that are essential to Waldorf to resonate within the educational community. There's just too much pressure. But in certain small areas, there's a great appreciation. And so you can see that um, and, and read that in the writing that's being done by others. This film we're making, I'm calling The Challenge of Rudolf Steiner. Um, what, what do you think that challenge is, or challenge is? 
I, I, I think that the challenges really rest with us as representatives of Steiner's work. And it's how can we convey to people an understanding of what we're trying to do that is done in a way that builds a bridge to their understanding. You know, Steiner said in building community lectures that he gave that we should speak to people about anthroposophy in a way that appeals to their naive understanding. And what I take that to mean is we should be able to explain what we do in a way in which that people will then just say, oh, I get that. And so how do we build that bridge in explaining things that are a little more esoteric? And then I think the challenge is how do we show interest in what other people do? For me, that's a big one because it's easy when you come with the insights of Steiner to feel that you have the privilege of a, um, of a true path. And then it, it's very possible that we do not look at our uh, colleagues in education in general with enough empathy and appreciation to recognize the good things that are being done. I believe that's a challenge that we face, and it's one that Steiner spoke about. Um, the, the other challenge that I, I see, just personally, is how do we, because to take up work that's spiritually based work, um, it implies that you have to work on yourself, and that's a challenge. And it's a challenge that the children present to you each day because they want to know that you're doing that inner work and your colleagues will present it to you um, because of the challenges of trying to work collaboratively with other human beings. Uh, but it's just a challenge that in a way we set for ourselves and it's always a challenge to be your best self and to be your best self in front of children and parents and that's a big challenge and uh, Where we walk to school each day, Indian children used to play. Jack, I just wanted to ask you, you know, as a class teacher, and you spoke earlier about the children uh, sensitive to what's living in you, yeah. which is a great challenge to you, obviously. What work do you do every day, apart from obviously preparing your lessons? Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether you're yeah. prepared to talk about it. Oh, well, you know, the question for me, that question is perhaps the most important one that I try to answer each day. I mean, it's important for me just how to be present in the classroom. One of the things I realized with these children, because this is the fourth class I've taken, and I would have thought that after three classes I would have known what to do. And these children showed me right away that I didn't. And what I came to learn, I'd come home and I would talk to my wife and about the day, and it dawned on me in that first year that if I'm in a good place, no matter what happens in the day, it's good. And so how do I get myself in that good place? And that's the work that I feel has to happen before the work. Um, there's this wonderful story by Zhuangzi, the old Taoist philosopher, where he talks about someone building a bell stand a uh, wooden bell stand, and, he, and the, the king says to him, so how did you make this? It looked like the gods helped you. And he said, no, it wasn't the gods. He said, when you told me you needed a bell stand, I was afraid, so I fasted. And after three days, I forgot about pain or pleasure. And after five days, I forgot about shame or praise. And after seven days, I forgot about self. And what that always reminds us is that there's work that comes before the work. And so every morning when I get up, and I, I get up early, um, I always have my reading that I do. But in my reading, whether I'm reading the Bible or something by Steiner or um, daily book of meditations or the calendar of the soul, I have this little calendar for each day. And in that calendar, I'll make a star and I'll start my day thinking of every child in my class. I do that every day. If that star is not colored in, I know I haven't done my work. And then if there's something that I have fallen short, I usually make a note so that I start the day remembering what I need to work on in myself. 
if there's a relationship with a particular child that has gotten contentious, I want to start the day remembering that so that when I greet them, I'm not surprised by our encounter or disappointed by my encounter with them. And that kind of inner work, um, I can't feel that my day is going to go well if I don't do that now. I'm sure my day could go well if I didn't on occasion, but I feel that that kind of discipline is very important to me. Um, the man who trained me to be a teacher, John Gardner, he taught us that discipline begins with self-discipline and that it's our ability to take ourselves in hand that really will help us to guide children in the right way, to be worthy of all they give you, because children look up to you in the most remarkable way. They see us as better than we are, you know, they, they, when they're young. Um, they, they see us um, as individuals who hold knowledge um, and wisdom and the ability to solve their problems. And it's not that we ever can live up to that completely, but if, we, if I work on myself, then I feel at least I'm more worthy of the love and affection they give you. And what I found with the children is that was what they were asking of me. And then I opened up this book, uh, which has Rudolf Steiner speaking to the faculty at the Stuttgart School. And what he said in it, which was so helpful to me, he said that a teacher needs more love than other people. In a family, we're asked to love three or four people, maybe five or six at most. He said, but a teacher's gonna be asked to love 20 or 30 people. And so that we have to work to have really an open-heartedness. And for me, that's, that's been the constant theme of my work. How do you learn to really give the children the love they need, still get them to do the work they have to put in their books, teach them all the things that they should learn in school, and do it in a way that they're responsible and polite and well-behaved, and still just love them. And that's the kind of paradox that you have to hold every day. And that's the thing that I've come to love about Waldorf education. And, and Steiner speaks about this. Um, what it asks of us is to hold polarities. You know, because to create discipline, you have to have form and a certain firmness and a plan, all things that are set out. And yet to balance that, you have to have presence and love and empathy. And the two of those, they stand in balance and they create a tension in the soul of the teacher. That's a dynamic, creative tension. And that balance changes every day. There's no recipe. You know, today I need two parts of firmness and one part of love. Or tomorrow I need two parts of love and one part of firmness. You just have to stand in the presence of the children and seek that balance. And so for me, it becomes my work to become conscious of that tension. And I think how perfect in the consciousness soul age that that's what's asked of us. And if you look in the world, that's what's asked of parents. You know? Because what I found, there's this saying by um, Niels Bohr, who was a Nobel Prize winner. He said that the opposite of an ordinary truth is false. But the opposite of a profound truth is often also true. And so a profound truth is that children need protection. And yet every parent knows that if you only protect your children, you weaken them. So the opposite's also true. They need times when they don't have protection. And children need to have boundaries, but they need times when the boundaries are expanded. And they need times when the work is serious and times when there's laughter. And that, that balance, that's what Steiner said, is the breathing that Waldorf education is all about. And so just trying to live into that and be present to that dynamic polarity. And Waldorf is filled with polarities, form and freedom, breathing in, breathing out, expansiveness and contraction, levity and gravity, you know, and that's what a teacher works with in the grade school, that works with those polarities. You used the word clairvoyance a little bit earlier when we were speaking about Steiner. I mean, that's, that's not an easy word to, Yes. about. I mean, it has yeah. certain connotations which yeah. are possibly not helpful in, in speaking about what Steiner was trying to bring. I mean, I want, what is your understanding 
of what Steiner called his clairvoyance, the source yeah. of these insights. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that I've come to feel is that people in general carry around degrees of clairvoyance. We do. They're, you know, if I ask the children, how many of you have dreams that have come true? And they mean that in, a, in an actual way. I'll have three or four children raise their hands. How many of you have known what someone was going to say before they said it? And uh, how many of you knew something was going to happen before it did? We carry around a, a mild level of clairvoyance. Um, the place where you see clairvoyance in a dramatic way is when you read what the people who've had near-death experiences say. They often have developed, no, they have developed within them through their experience higher levels of clairvoyance where they just know. Uh, the people who've studied this, like uh, Dr. Moody who was out in Virginia, um, he would have gatherings of people who've had near-death experiences and he would say to them, how many of you knew this? Something was going to happen before it did or when you speak to someone you see pictures. And so many people would raise their hands. So it's not just Steiner, but Steiner's clairvoyance, to my mind, was so highly developed. As a teacher, I don't have those qualities. And so as a Waldorf teacher, I have to ask myself, what then is my assignment? And what I like to believe is that my assignment is to carry within me certain anthroposophical ideas that become my working ideas. Um, and they're like what Steiner calls anthroposophical habits of mind. And I carry those in me and into my work. And then there are moments of insight where I'll think, oh my goodness, that's what he meant. And I'll see it living in an experience. And though that's not a clairvoyant experience, it makes Steiner's clairvoyant understandings possible, makes it possible for them to live in me in a real way. Because that's the question, what am I to do with his understandings if I can't share them? And so I take them on with goodwill and the hope that the ideas that resonate in me will live in me and guide me. I like to think of those ideas as if they were underground springs and that my task is like a dowser to tap into that. And when I do, I feel like those ideas just bubble up. And the way a spring bubbles up, it makes everything around it fertile and rich. And it becomes this attraction that draws animals and plant life. And that's what I hope that Steiner's clairvoyant ideas will give to me. You know, the ability to have new insights, fresh insights that come out of his understandings. Um, you know, I have read the books he's written, um, but my level of development, you know, is, is, is not such that it makes me feel like I have those kind of ideas to guide me, insights, experiences. And so I rely on a few simple ideas of Steiner's to guide my work. Neil. One of the things that surprised me in teaching was when I came to realize that what we wanted to do in our class was to create a conspiracy. I, by that I mean that the word conspiracy means to breathe together. And that's what I feel we do as class teachers. We help our children breathe together. And especially on a Monday after they come back from the weekend where everybody has a different breathing rate you know, some children run around all weekend doing errands and visiting. Some children stay in their pajamas all day on Saturday and stay close to home. Um, they all breathe at a different rate. And when they come back on Monday, it's my job to, to bring them back into a cohesiveness, a classness. And so all the work that we do on Monday with the poem of, you know, where we walk to school each day and the rhythmic counting, it's all my effort to create conspiracy, to unite them in, in um, a community effort. And isn't that necessary today in our world where our communities have really become dispersed? And you know, when I look at the way children in a grade school, in a Waldorf school, who are together year after year feel about each other, I don't think there's any time in a person's life when they love their friends as much as children do in the grade school. And how their hearts just open to their friends. 
And I believe that that love of their friends lasts a lifetime. I know when I went to my son's wedding uh, about five years ago, his whole wedding party were all his friends from grade school that he was close to. And you could just feel that that, that that affection still lingers. And I really believe that by doing this work in poetry and rhythmic movement, we foster that ability to open up a child's heart um, to their, their friends. I think about the world that the children that we teach and raise will inherit and how many problems will be in that world. And I think about the kind of thinking that's going to be needed to solve the complex, seemingly insolvable problems that we have in the world with the environment, with our cities, with our prisons, and even in America with our democracy. And I know that the problems aren't going to be solved easily. They're going to require a type of thinking that is new and innovative. And I believe Waldorf kids, and I'm not just saying this to, to sell Waldorf, but I believe the kind of thinking that's fostered in a Waldorf school allows children to think out of the box. My daughter graduated last Monday from college, and we went down for her graduation and saw her professors. And the best thing that one of her professors said to me, it was a professor for her African-American poetry class, said, you know, I love your daughter's papers. They're not cookie-cutter papers. She thinks out of the box. And I thought to myself, now that's a tribute to Waldorf education that she had. I feel children are going to need to ask the questions that nobody's asking yet to help solve the world's problems. So although I'm not encouraged by what I see in the world, I'm hopeful by the work we do in our school that it's really going to perhaps serve Waldorf education in this way. You know, one of our uh, graduates is the president of American Express, um, Ken Chenault. And when 9-11 happened, his building was right across from the World Trade Center. And he had to speak to his employees. And someone said to him, what could you say? And he said, I felt like I had to tell them the truth and I had to give them hope. And that, to me, is a good picture of what a Waldorf student carries because they carry the cognitive awareness that you have to be able to explain things to people in a way that they can understand what's going on. And yet you have to do it in a way that takes into account their soul. And that I like, I find that hopeful. And then the other thing that gives me hope is um, when I read someone like Tom, Thomas Friedman, who has written The World is Flat, New York Times reporter and author, he spoke in Washington, D.C. Uh, a while back at a high school. And the students in that high school said to him, uh, Mr. Friedman, what should we be doing to prepare ourselves for this new global economy? And he said to them that your education has been a very good education, but it's only used one side of your brain, the left side. And if you want to be part of the future, use the other side of your brain as well. If you don't, Somebody in a developing country is going to do what you're trained to do for much less money. And if you don't, a computer is going to do what you're trained to do much more quickly. So if you want to be part of the future, he said, think art, think green, think connectedness. And that gives me hope that we're preparing our children in the Waldorf School for the 21st century. Often when people look at a Waldorf school, they think, wow, that's the way schools used to be. Children bring their lunch to school in little baskets. They dress in this nice way where they wear leggings and hats. And, and people think it's a throwback. But when I read what people are writing about education, I really feel that we are on the forefront of what children need for tomorrow. And uh, I just hope that people start to recognize that.